Thank you, Dorinda. Third chapter of Colossians. I would like to finish this chapter, and I would also like to uh, finish verse 1 of chapter 4. It shouldn't take very long because we covered most of it uh, Sunday night, but I do want to touch on it again and then finish this up. And then I'd like to have a testimony service. Uh, I know people, a lot of people don't like testimony service, especially if the preaching is excluded, and I can understand that because people come to hear the preaching of the Word. But uh, since there's just a few verses here, I would really like to, if we have time, when we finish this chapter. Yes. Yes, keep praying for her. She's just awful weak. She's just awful weak. Uh, remember uh, Charlie and Annie? I went out to see them this morning, and uh, they, they ate something or something Sunday that's really give them a bad time. They seem to be in pretty good spirits other than that, and they are doing better. Continue to pray for Mary, wherever she is. <laughs> I went to the hospital this morning, and they didn't even know they had a rehab center. I never did find her. That was so strange. I went over there. They didn't have any record of her. And I said, well, she's in your rehab center. And they didn't even know they had a rehab center. And found out a while ago it's out behind Drysdale's. That's out there on Memorial. So I'm going to try to find out tomorrow uh, where she is. And hopefully she won't be out time I can get over there to see her. Look at verse 17 in chapter 3, if you will. As I was studying this today, it, it's amazing how things come into your life. It's, little things happen, and a lot of times they're humorous. But, you know, I really believe, and I'm believing more all the time, that we could use just about anything that happens in our life, God has a message in it. God has a reason for what he does. Yesterday we were painting, and, and I'm not, I just kind of, you know, like to get it done, and... So I was painting, and I kind of got through with the wall, and I said, I said, this, this is finished, this is finished. Susie looked at it, and she said, boy, I'm glad you're not the Lord. She said, because you'd just sit down and say it's finished, and we'd still have to work for our salvation. In other words, she didn't think it was finished. You know, and I, I'll, I'll try to show you the lesson that I learned in that. She's a very good teacher. Uh, but we need to, to look at things that happen in our lives whether they're good experiences, bad experiences, whether they're, th they're things that people just say. Because a lot of the teaching that God gives us, I believe, are in just everyday occurrences, if we'll look for them, if we'll look for them. Now look at verse 17. Now in verse 17, if we could and if we would apply this, just this one verse, if we just took one verse and cut it out of the Bible, pasted it on the wall or the mirror, memorized it, hid this word in our heart, if all believers would do this, it would a absolutely revolutionize the church. I don't mean just this church. I'm talking about the church, the, the church world. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed... Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. What he's saying here is this. Every one of us that are saved are Christ's representative. Everything we do, we do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, so therefore we shouldn't do anything, whether it's word or deed, that would bring dishonor to Christ. And, you know, I really believe in my life, and I'm sure in your life, that that should be a motto. That should be something that, uh, that would be good for me, maybe good for you. I think it would be a good verse for me to memorize, and the first thing when I open my eyes in the morning is quote that verse. Every hour on the hour, quote that verse keep that constantly before me that I am an ambassador for Christ. I am an, a representative for Christ and anything that I do or say should bring glory to his name. Does that make sense? 
and I certainly shouldn't do or say anything that would uh, not bring glory to his name. One time, I, when I, way back then when I was working for Safeway and I was just a young man, uh, I was arguing with the meat cutter that I was working with, and he said, I don't see anything wrong with dances. He said, I just don't see a thing wrong with dances. And I said, well, let me tell you what you do. He said, next time you go to dance, you take your Bible, and you just go in there at Cain's and say, whoa, stop the music. We're going to read a couple of verses and have prayer before the dance starts. <coughs> He said, well, you can't do that. I said, well, then you shouldn't be there. Does that make any sense? Now, I know there's a lot of places where you couldn't do that, but it shouldn't be an embarrassment to do that. Now, here's something you do next time you rent a movie. Put the movie in the VCR. All get around, bow your heads, and say, Lord... We're going to watch this movie to your glory, to your honor, and your praise. You know where most of the movies would go? Right back in the jacket and right back to the video store. Because you couldn't watch most movies and say, we're doing this to God's glory, honor, and praise. Now, to me, that verse just kind of sets up the rest of the chapter. Everything you do do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then now he's, what he's saying here and getting ready to do is give the order, the divine order for the families. And we should do this because we're ambassadors for Christ. Now notice this. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Now please keep something in mind here. He's speaking to Christian families. Now, he's not saying to women, if you live with a drunken tyrant, do everything he tells you to do. That's not what he's saying at all. He's talking to Christian women. Now, notice there's three reasons why he says to do this or how to do this, the attitude to do this. First of all, the wife is to be voluntarily submissive to the husband. It shouldn't be something that you're forced to do. In the second place, you should do it because the verse preceding that, or not preceding that, but right after that, says you should do that because your husband loves you. Your husband loves you. And that word love there is agape, which means he is very concerned for what is best for you. And, you know, I really believe this with all my heart, and I've said this, and I don't know how many times I've said it, but I, there comes one more time. I don't believe that we would have any trouble getting our wives to submit to us if we were the kind of husbands we should be. If our main concern was their welfare and what's good for them, I don't think we'd have any trouble getting our wives to submit to us. And the third reason that a woman should do that is because that's fit in the Lord. That pleases God. That's just what you're supposed to do. And verse 17 says that everything we should do, everything we should do, we do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do what pleases the Father. And that's what pleases the Father. Now notice this. Children, obey your parents in all things. Not some things. In all things. But once again, he's speaking of having Christian parents. And here's something else where it says obey your parents. That word in the Greek could be, is, is paternal. In other words, it could be mother or father. Obey your, obey your parents in all things. In all things. If they're Christians, obey them. You see, children don't always understand and they don't always have to understand but they should always be obedient. Now, I remember when Robin, I keep telling this, when Robin was a little bitty, she was so bullheaded. When did you get over that? I wasn't around, I guess. I don't think she ever did. She's still bullheaded. But she was so bullheaded, and she wouldn't do anything unless first she could understand why you wanted her to do it. See? Well, that's not necessary. It should be because father or because mother tells you to do it. Children, obey your parents. Why? 
because it is well-pleasing unto the Lord. And once again, it's not speaking of ungodly parents just trying to teach a child to lie or to steal or do those sort of things. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about Christian parents because they love you and they're trying to bring you up. And parents need to discipline their children. I, I'll tell you what, I don't like to live next door to people that don't discipline their children. It's a terrible thing. And I don't like to see parents whip their children. But I'd a lot rather see them whip their children than have to live next door to them if they don't. You're supposed to discipline your children. Uh, John Plowman said, "If you give a, if you, if you, uh, if you give to a hog every time he grunts, and give to a child every time he cries, you'll have a mighty fine hog and a terrible child." In other words, you'll fatten up the hog, but you're going to have a terrible child. But you know what? I really believe the reason we don't discipline our children. And once again, John Plowman said, you're either going to have headaches or heartaches. And it's not easy to discipline a child. But you have to do it for their own good. You've got to make them mind when they're little. Because if you don't, there's going, there's going to be a heartache to you. And it's not easy. And it's not, it, no one likes to chastise their children. I never did. Oh, I just, man, I used to rather take a whip of myself than have to whip Robin. I never did have to whip Cher Lee. She caught on. She's smarter than her big sister. She really was. She'd watch me whip Robin, and she'd say, hey, I'm straightening up my act. I just didn't have, she would just kind of, you could just, boy, that'd better cure her. But Robin, it just, I mean, stand there and just like blink her eyes like a toad in a hailstorm. You know, she just, stubborn as she could be, you know. And I didn't want to whip her, but I, I'd have to do it. And I remember when my boy was a little bitty in the car, he thought as long as he was looking you right in the eye and you was looking him right in the eye, you couldn't see what his hand was doing. And he liked to play with the door handle. He liked to reach over and open the car door when you're going. And he couldn't understand how in the world I could be looking right directly in his eye and know that he's opening the car door. And boy, we'd pop his hand. Boy, he'd cry and he'd bawl. And he'd look and he'd look and he'd just reach over like this. You know, and go for that door handle again. Slap his hand. And we had to do it till finally, after the third cast, he caught on. <laughs> no, no, we never did injury. But listen, now you could say, oh, well, you know, he's so sweet. I just don't, you know, after all, he's just a year old or two years old. I, you know, I don't want to. Listen, I'd rather paddle his hand than have him fall out of the car door. But that's the way children are. You've got to discipline. But, but look at the next part of it. Now, children should obey because it's for their own good and it's also well-pleasing unto the Lord. But notice this. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. What does this mean? What does this verse mean? It means... Don't be picking on your kids. Oh, you can't do nothing right. I told you to do it this way, and you did it that way. Well, you tied the wrong shoe first. See, that will absolutely ruin a child. But you know, a lot of times, parents, they want their children to be carbon copies of themselves. They've already got a career picked out for their child. Well, when my son grows up, he's going to be a doctor. And boy, they, they don't... You see what I'm saying? We've got to remember that our children are individuals. No two children are alike. Charlie and, and, and Sh uh well, none of them are alike. <laughs> They're just not alike. They're individuals, and you have to let them be individuals. And you also have to make allowances for the fact that children will do some dumb things and they'll make some mistakes, but don't be picking them to pieces. You've got to discipline them when they're wrong, but also let them be children. And I hate to see people that's just always on their kids, always for every little thing. Pick this up, put that down, do this, blah, 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 blah. And it says that the children will get, get discouraged, and I really hate to hear people constantly telling their children how worthless they are. That's a terrible thing to do to a child, constantly telling them how worthless that they are. But now listen, when it comes to button heads, you've got to be strong. The parent has to be the parent because the child is the child. And you have to let them know that they can't get by with it. If you tell them to do something, follow through and make them do it. One thing that aggravates me is to hear some mama yell at their kids say, You quit that. I said you quit that. Stop, 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 stop. Stop, stop, stop. You quit that, you quit that, you quit that. And then they just let them go ahead and do it anyway. 
Have you ever seen anybody like that? They'll yell and yell and yell, and you're standing like this going, oh. <laughs> you know, and they'll holler and they'll yell, and then just let the kid go ahead and do what they want to anyway. I lost a real good customer like that one time when I had the meat market. There's a woman come in there, and I'll tell you what, I mean, she had a brat. No fault of his, it was her fault. That kid was in everything. Boy, he'd run over, and he'd get him a candy bar, and he'd come back, and his mom said, no, 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 no. And she'd take it away and go put it up. He'd run over and get some potato chips while she'd put the candy bar. Here he'd come with the potato chips. No, you can't have that. You can't have it. She'd go put it back. So he'd run over there, and he got some pop. Here he come with a bottle of pop. No, you can't have that. No, 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 you can't have that. And he said, you go put that back. You go put it back. He said, you go put it back. She said, okay. And so she took it and went and put it back. And she come back over and she started telling me about her teenage son who was in prison. I said, you know what? This one's going to be in prison too. And it really shocked her. I said, this child here will grow up and go to prison. I said, because you are not making him respect your authority and he will not respect the police either. Now, I'm not going to tell you who that child is, but my wife had that child in her class last year. Now, when I first encountered him, he wasn't even in school. He was probably about five years old. When she encountered him, he was about nine years old, and he was absolute, holy terror. He had to be taken out of the class about the middle of the year. That Nobody could control him. They put him in another class, and that teacher had fits with him. He, because the parents won't do their job. Absolutely won't do their job. Now it gets into servants. Servants obey, all, uh, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord, that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Boy, I'll tell you what, as I was studying this, something really opened my eyes. That I'm going to get back to the painting incident. Now, I realized that was my apartment, and I could do whatever I wanted to. And I did. And Susie had to straighten it up, Susie and Sandy. But that's not right. I don't care whether it's mowing the yard. I don't care whether, it's, especially if you're working on the job. A lot of times people work if the boss is looking. Or they'll do just what they have to do to get by. Paul says, don't do that. And he says, first of all, you're not working for that man. You're working for the Lord. See, do you, something, here's something we don't realize. Uh, man, I preach. You all teach Sunday school. We go out and we witness. Or we'll sing. We come to church and worship. Do you realize going to work in the morning is worship? If you do it unto the Lord... And do you realize that if you do, you will receive a reward? I never thought about it like that. I thought, well, I'm just going to go to work and do just what I have to do and then get and go home. Huh? That's not what Paul says. God is watching you, and what he rewards us for is not the amount of talent you have, not how well you preach, not how well you teach, not how well you play the piano, not how well you lead the singing, but by your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. And we look at the bigger things and don't realize that God is looking at our little individual everyday things. All that you do in word and do, do as unto the Lord. When we go to work, do the John Plowman said, I think the Christian ought to be the best plowman in the field. He said, I don't think he should stop to talk even if it's about religion because he said it isn't right. It isn't right to your employer. We need to work realizing that God sees us and that's a form of worship and we should give it all we have, whether the boss cares or not. And I know that, that we don't live in a perfect society and I know that a lot of times you can have a man over here that's a real good worker. 
a real good worker. And you have somebody over here who's not a very good worker, but he's in real thick with the boss, and when time for promotion, he gets promoted. Well, that discourages the guy over here who's really working hard. But Paul's saying, don't worry about it, because the Lord's the one that's going to reward you. The Lord knows who's doing their job, and that's very important to the Lord. Do it with all of your heart, realizing that God will give you a reward for faithfulness. So the next time I paint, you ought to see my yard. I did mow the yard today. I did a good job. I believe I did a better job of mowing that yard than I ever have. I mean, I got closer, you know. I mean, I really did. Boy, I moved stuff and mowed under, you know. And, because that had an impact on me. And I thought, well, now, wait a minute. Always before, I mowed just to get by Susie. You know, it's like, well, I mowed and she'd look and go, well, yeah. I mowed the yard today, honey. Yeah, I see you did. Yeah. I guess. You know. But today, I got to tell boy, when I mowed that yard, man, I got really hot and sweating and all, you know. Boy, I'd move the swing set, and I'd mow under that leg, and I'd go over here, and I'd move this leg, and I'd mow it. You know, you know what I'm saying? Now, I didn't get weed-eated yet. Didn't get any weed-eated yet. But I said, wait a minute, I'm not doing this for Susie. I'm doing this for the Lord. And the Lord's watching me, and I want to be faithful in anything I do. I want to do it the best I can do. And I realize a lot of people might do it a lot better. But I want to do the best I can, which is... What I'm saying is your apartment's going to look a lot better than her apartment. See, because I read this verse. We painted her apartment before we got to your apartment. You're going to get a number one job. Because we're doing it for the Lord. <laughs> we messed yours up in the name of the Lord. But we're going <laughs> Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. When we go to work and work on the job, we're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a form of worship. That's a part of our service. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Boy, we might get by and we might fool the boss and we might think, well, and I might fool Susie and say, well, you know, there's some things she didn't see, but if she don't see them, I'm not going to go straighten them up, you know. Some grass around there, she don't look around the side of the house and all that. But God sees it, and there's going to be a judgment. And he's going to take it up with us how faithful we were. How faithful we were as a, as a laborer, or as a doctor, or as a plumber, or as an electrician, or whatever our job is. Do it as unto the Lord. You might not even like the guy you're working for. That's beside the point. That's beside the point. You might can't stand him. He don't appreciate anything. He don't pay you enough. He's always, whatever. That's beside the point. Do it for the Lord. And realize the Lord's the one that's going to reward you. And it says masters, employers. In this case, he's talking about slaves and slave owners. But masters, given to your servants that which is just and equal. Be fair with them knowing that you also have a master in heaven. You have a master in heaven. And is he fair with you? Yes, he is. Then you being fair with, be fair with your employees, those under you. And here's, I want to finish with this one point. One more point. Some people have more talent than other people. Some just do. Some just have a lot of, uh, of talent. Some people were born with a lot higher IQ. Some people were born to where they have more advantages. Maybe they were born in a family that, that is uh, well-known in a community, which opens doors for the children. Uh, some people are born with a real good business sense, and it's just easy for them to make a lot of money. Some people are born in situations that their folks can send them to, say, law school, or they can become a doctor or whatever, where they can make a lot of money. But remember, the Bible says this, what do you have that you didn't receive? Now think about this. If you have a high IQ, it's because God gave it to you. If you have a beautiful voice, 
It's because God gave it to you. See, what do you have that you didn't receive? Not a thing. Whatever you have is because God gave that to you. Now, God in his wisdom chose not to make us all just the same. There's some that are smarter than others. There's some that are more talented to others. God also has called some into various ministries, but God has a reason for all of it. Some were born into slavery. That was no fault of their own. They were born into slavery, whereas some were born as a family of slave owners. But that's the situation that God put you in. That doesn't make you any better or any worse than anybody else. Does that make sense? So he says, masters, you're equal. Treat them as equals. And here's something that I'd like for you to realize. All of us are saved. We're all in the body of Christ. Now think about this. We're all members of one body, which means I'm part of you. You're part of me. And we're all part of Christ, and he's part of us. Does that make sense? We're all one. We're all one. Why in the world would we mistreat part of our body? There's no way I would. I wouldn't cut one of my fingers off. We're all one. We're all part of Christ. Christ is, part, is, is in us. We're in one another. So whether God happened to put you here as a, as a rich person or a poor person, as a slave owner or slave, if you're saved, and that's what Paul's saying, if that master saved and that servant saved, you're all part of one body. Treat them right. Slave, work for the master. Work for him. He's part of the body. Work for him as you would for the Lord Jesus Christ because we're all in Christ. We're all in all. Now that we've all learned that lesson, it all boils down to this. Shall we apply it? Or shall we just leave and say, pretty good Bible lesson. I wonder what he's going to do Sunday night. You know, a lot of times that's the way we do. It just kind of goes in one ear and out the other ear. But you know, I've, I've really purposed in my heart, and I'm as guilty as anybody, but I, I really purposed in my heart just lately that I'm going to start giving heed to the Word of God. You see, it's not the hearers of the Word, but the doers of the Word that are justified. It's not those that just hear the Word, but those that take the Word and apply it to their lives. That's when things are going to start changing in my life. That's when things are going to start changing in your life, and that's when things are going to start changing in the church. That's when families are going to start coming together and things are just going to start working out better, and that's when better jobs are going to start opening up for you people because you'll be better employees. And the boss won't know it, but you're working for the Lord. He thinks you're doing it for him. It doesn't make any difference what he thinks. You're going to be an honest employee, a hardworking employee. Let's start applying what God is trying to tell us, or it's not going to do any good anyway, is it? You can bring home all the vegetables in the world, but if they don't go in the soup, you're not going to get any nourishment. Uh, we've got seven minutes left, and I would like to ask Wayne if he would come and... Uh, just lead us in a short testimony, and, and uh, he can lead, lead, and if anybody has a testimony, we'll give you a testimony, and then we'll close.